So what we have here is our Raspberry Pi fully assembled with the hat installed. But it doesn't have an operating system, so what we have to do is install Linux on it. As you've just seen, I've just flashed Raspbian 64-bit Bookworm on here. Bookworm was my nickname in high school. So the operating system is ready to go. I've connected here, this is a USB dongle for my keyboard and mouse. And right here we have a screen. So all I should need to do here is plug in the, U the HDMI cable to the screen and then connect power to this USB port on the Raspberry Pi. Whoops. And, and there it is. You can see there's Raspberry Pi desktop powered by Raspberry Pi OS 64-bit. Okay. Welcome to Raspberry Pi desktop. Okay, so look, guess what? Our mouse is working. So we, if you're using a Bluetooth keyboard or mouse, put them into pairing mode while they're connected, they're fine. <laughs> so what we have is a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W with Bookworm installed running on my Wi-Fi. Uh, on my local and you know, network and that only reason that that's important is that means I can connect to it from other computers on my network and uh, Then I don't need the screen and I don't need the keyboard. So um, But there is one thing that I do need to make that work interface options and SSH is Fundamental I need SSH to be working so that I can connect So I'm going to say yes so now I'm going to unplug the keyboard and the, uh, the screen. So that computer will now work disconnected from anything. I should now be able to power this Raspberry Pi and watch it come up. All right. And if you notice, all you can see is a blinking light. However, if I start, I'll do this on my computer over here. All right, so I am now connected from this screen on my Mac over here to the Raspberry Pi. And that means I can now SSH to the Pi. Oh, it doesn't have a name. Of course, I have to give it a name. So right now I'm going to have to use the internet, the IP address to connect to it. All right, so I am now connected to this Raspberry Pi. And this Raspberry Pi has a total of 500K of RAM it doesn't have much swap, 100k of swap, so we have to fix that. And it is not running anything, and it's not connected to anything. So what we'll do is set up a few things and get, um, get everything connected. So what I've found is with any Raspberry Pi new out of the box, that the swap space is just, well, not enough. Um, the memory is fine, it generally runs within the memory it needs, but it gets a tiny a little bit of swap space to start with. So the first thing I do, setting up a Pi, is just increase the swap space. There's uh, this one website that has a great set of instructions that I find I go back to over and over again, links in the description. And uh, this is how it works. I don't use nano, I use vi or vi, so just edit that file. 
and all you basically need to do is come in here and increase this to and I find that 2048 is plenty um, and that's basically it then you need to run this command to actually increase the amount of swap space allocated and then Turn the swap space back on. And now if I run top, you will see that right up here we're running yeah, two gigabytes of swap. So that should be absolutely plenty. I use Tailscale to set up a VPN to my Raspberry Pi. It's not only for security, it's actually, I mean, just as much for convenience. With Tailscale, I can give each one of my devices a name so I don't have to remember IP addresses and I can address them from anywhere, no matter which um, Wi-Fi network I'm on, which is incredibly convenient, um, especially I've got like six Wi-Fi networks in my house and I'm always getting confused about which one I'm on. With Tailscale, I don't have to care. I can just use a name and uh, if you have a look here, and we're not logged in. Okay, I have I have a number of machines already set up on Tailscale, and um, it, and Tailscale gives you the ability to name them, so um, it, it you you get um, you know a pretty much randomly a generated internal VPN IP address that no one else can see and no one else can access except you logged into your VPN network and it's very very easy to just add a new device and this is how you do it so we go to download and we say we're going to download for Linux okay so here is the command that you need to install and what we'll do is we'll bring our warp window to the front and we'll run that command to install Tailscale and there we go so let's start Tailscale All right, and here's the trick. Copy that link and flip back to tail scale and oh, I have to log in to do it. And I can authorize tail scale. And once I click here, tail scale comes up. There it is, we are connected. And here we have, somewhere in here, we will have the new device, which I remember calling Cube Red. Now I use a separate name for the raw device which is going to be at its IP address so that it doesn't get confused. So I always edit, change the machine name and in this case I'm just going to call it Cube Pi Red or sorry Cube Red. So Cube Red will be what it's called on tail scale and that's the address that I can use to address it from anywhere on my VPN. And let's go have a look at how that works. If I open a new and I can ping cube red, there it is, and I can SSH to first time in, you always have to do that.
and there we go. So we're logged into the QBread to QBread Pi using the QBread VPN connection over there, and we're logged into the, the QBread Pi using the IP address over here. So with a little bit of help from Josh at Botblocks and from Tridge, I got the QBread connected to the Raspberry Pi using the Botblocks little tiny network switch and the adapter. So what needed to happen to make that work is that first of all the switch needs power. So this, this connector here can give it power. The simplest answer was just to take power uh, from I squared C adapter on the board. Uh, that might not be, you know, what you want to do in the actual vehicle. It actually has um, two pads here from, for powering from the battery and in the vehicle, that's probably a better idea on the bench. I think that's, this is fine. The, uh, the ethernet cable from the cube red connects into this uh, RJ45 socket on this RD pilot adapter and then a just a straight through JST, four pin JST GH connector connected to this port labeled ARD on the board, on the adapter board, that can connect to one of the outputs on the switch. So this gives you the ability to have one, two, three, four, five devices connected I'm going to be connecting one more because I'll connect in the A8 Mini onto probably onto one of these ports here like this one. It's not powered right now so a little green light's not going to come on but that's how it'll be connected. And that gives me, uh, so this is power, that's not actually a connection, this is just powering the switch. So I've got three connections, I've got the cube red connected here, I'll have the A8 mini connected here, and the Raspberry Pi connected here. And basically it's working. So here I have the Raspberry Pi and it's connected to the uh, so the cube red and that's the little applet that runs that's uh, called web underscore um, web server that is running on the cube red. So that's the RD Pilot web server. As you can see, I've configured the IP addresses to 144.30 and it runs on port 8080. And with SD card access, I can actually access the SD card. I can go into here into, and I could, for example, look at my logs, look at my terrain data, or um, yeah, I can up down. I can go see the logs in the log directory, and I could download a log. Oh, and that downloaded already because these logs are pretty tiny. Oh, there we go. Completed 124k log, and um, if I download this one, which is a large test file that I installed, I just install this one. You can see that I'm getting. about 2.5 megabits megabytes per second download speed uh, and this is the Raspberry Pi downloading directly from the cube red onto the Raspberry Pi so not to my PC or anything like that but actually even though um, and I've tested this I can get pretty close to 2 megabytes per second even when I then proxy this out and connect it onto a PC so it's actually pretty good I mean it's not the 80 megabytes per second that I thought I was going to get but it's um, still uh, way better than USB so there we go we have we have liftoff we have Network connectivity running on the cube red, connected via via a switch, and that is step one. So now I'm going to put more software onto the Raspberry Pi, so we can get things like Arduino Pilot Cloud, 
uh, Mavlink to REST and forwarding of Mavlink to Mission Planner and Ground Control. So here we have all of the components. We have the cube red, we have the, uh, the IP switch, we have the Raspberry Pi, we have the adapter, and we have, whoops, not the fan, but we, oh, we have the A8 Mini connected. What I'm do is I'm gonna plug in the cube red. I'm gonna plug in the Raspberry Pi and I'm going to connect power to the A8 Mini. So what we're going to do now is just quickly have a look at the ArduPilot configuration required to get the networking working. It's really not too complicated actually. Okay, so what you need to do, we've got two COM ports here. One of them is going to be the primary, one of them is going to be the secondary. We're going to ignore the secondary for now. And we're just going to connect into the primary flight controller. And as we can see, this is cube red primary. And the options are all available in the full parameter list. And the first thing you need to do is just check net underscore so the first one that will need to be set is net enabled this will be one of those once you enable it other stuff happens so all these other parameters when you first come in here and you look for net underscore you won't see anything else net enabled will be zero and nothing else will show up so what you will need to do uh, is set net enabled to one and write the parameters and then do a refresh and then everything else will show up. Now, there are some default parameters set in the, the net options because I'm guessing that, well, something had to be defaulted. Maybe it didn't have to be defaulted, but um, what I have chosen to do, and these are the ones where I have, let me just see if I've got non-default and I can see what I actually set net underscore enabled. Let's just go for net underscore. So the net enabled, I've set the gateway address, the IP address, and some port information. So the first one, let's just do, let's just turn that off again so we can see the full set. So the first thing we do is net address one. Now, the way IP addresses work in ArduPilot, just because of, let's just say just because, historical limitations, blah, blah, blah. Um, the actual components of the network address actually need to be set as separate parameters. So you've got a normally a network, an IP address of 192.168.144.30 that needs to be set as IP address 0 is 192, IP address 1 is 168, IP address 2 is 144, IP address 3 is 30. 192.168.144.30 needs to be set as four separate parameters. That's just the way it is. The second one that needs to be set is the gateway address. And typically that will be a 0 or 1 of the same subnet that you're using. That's typically the way it will work. So in this case, the gateway address I've set is 192.168.144.1. And I'm using 192.168.144.30 because the, uh, the A8 mini um, camera that I'm also going to be setting up already has sort of hard-coded locked us in to 144. The A8 Mini expects the gateway to be 192.168.144.1, and the A8 Mini expects the IP address, its IP address, to be 192.168.144.25. So what I decided to do was use 
192.168.144.2 as the address of the Raspberry Pi. So the gateway will be one, the Raspberry Pi will be two, and then the network IP address 30, if you notice, matches my Mavlink ID that I've set for this particular flight controller. So the IP address 30 matches my Mavlink ID. It just seems to be an, an easy way to manage things. You know, you can set a parameter you like uh, for whatever you want. And I just want to mention yet again, and I'll say it again, that sure you can set your IP address up here to match your local network, the IP address that your Wi-Fi network gives you or your router gives you when you plug in. But you run a risk there. If you do that, then when you take the flight controller out to the field, it might not work because the network that it thinks it belongs to isn't there anymore. So I've made a conscious choice here to not use my local IP addresses of my local networks. One of them is runs on 10.0.0 and the other one runs on 192.168.100. And I'm not gonna use either of those. I specifically want to use not that because I wanna know that when I take this out and plug it in in the field, it will still work. And when I don't have access to those IP ranges and those subnet networks. So, uh, so that's why I've set my gateway address and my IP address, as you can see here, gateway one, 144.1, IP address 144.30. The MAC address, it defaults, I don't see any good reason why you should need to understand it or change it. It'll just do something and it'll set itself to something. And unless there's a good reason, don't change it. I'd say as simple as that. Um, the net, net mask is 24. And that just means that we're using a 24 bit um, subnet. And that is a good idea. I'm just going to say again, assume that that's good and there's no reason to change it unless there's a reason to change it then you don't need to worry i want to keep this simple what do you need to know okay network options there's a bit mark there in this case there is an option to enable the ppp ethernet gateway I'm not going to do that right now but i will do a separate video i think i know what's going on there uh, it's a very interesting way that the um, the cube red primary should be able to network to the cube red secondary Not for this video. We're going to keep it simple The second thing that we need to do is to set up network ports. So Just because of how I'd previously done it. I set my Network ports to port 2 and port 3. So I've set port 2 to be UDP and it will be a UDP server and that means it basically sits and waits for other things to talk to it and so i've set udp server the cube red will basically sit and listen for udp connections for mavlink connections at port 14550 i also like to have tcp ip so i've set port 3 to be a tcp server at 5760 the standard Mavlink port for TCP. And that's it. That's all you need to do for getting the network to connect. There is an optional extra, which makes a lot of sense to enable, and that is web. And this web enables the website, the little minimalist audio pilot website that runs on the server, and it runs in Lua script. So web enable needs to be turned on. Well, actually, before you do that, scripting needs to be turned on. So scripting needs to be turned on for this to work, for the Lua script um, web server to work. So there's script enable is one. When you enable script enable, you pretty much need a minimum heap size of uh, 250K because I don't know. I mean, a little, a small website like the script like this doesn't need it. But if you want to run other scripts that do actually useful things, you need to give it a lot of memory. It's as simple as that. And the VM count I set to 200,000 is pretty much as a standard these days. So that should be enough for that to work. 
So you turn on scripting, and once you turn on scripting, and just to be clear about this, you put the net web server Lua on red under net web server Lua onto the flight controller. I've created a slightly modified version called net web server for the cube red, um, but that's the, the basically the Lua script um, published on the autopilot website. You can find it in the GitHub, but you need to put that web server into the scripts directory as a standard. And once you do that you, and reboot, then you will get a web underscore enable parameter, this one here, the same thing. It will be the only parameter that appears, but once you enable it and refresh, then everything else will show up. And you don't really need to set anything on here. Personally, I'm not a big fan of having web server, HTTP web servers run at port 8080. I think port 80 was what it was designed for. So I, w I usually prefer to run it as port 80, but I want to keep this simple for you. Use the defaults. There is nothing you need to change. You're nothing you need to change in here. Web enable one and that will give you the web server. So that's the settings. I'm going to roll it backwards. Web enable one, SCR enable one, 250,000 for the heap size and VMI count 200,000 and net enable one. It really should be enable, not enabled. And I think that's a problem that it's enabled because it's not consistent with everything else. But uh, right now that's what it looks like it's going to be. The IP address, you need to configure the IP address and the gateway to match. Pick an IP address for your flight controller and then the gateway should probably be zero or one at that same subnet. Don't change anything else. Add at least a port for UDP which is, and that should be a server port in my opinion. That's the best way to do it. And that means anything can connect to it from anywhere. So server port two, protocol Mavlink and 14550. I also created a TCP server port running Mavlink at 5760 and that's it, you're done. So, it, I need to install, well, I don't really need to install, but I like to install. Let's say I like to install Mav Proxy on a Raspberry Pi. It helps to have that command line interface to the flight controller to connect directly from the Raspberry Pi for kind of debugging purposes. Mav Proxy runs on Python, so it's pretty inefficient. I don't like to use it as the router and we will install uh, Mav P2P in a minute, so you can see how I actually set up routing. You can also use Mav Router. But Mav Proxy is incredibly useful to have, and the first step to making sure that everything's up and running and that you can connect to the flight controller and, and, and do things. So now what I'm gonna do, and this is very gonna be very interesting because I'm basically following the instructions from the RD Pilot website over here this is the instructions and so let's go with installing python 3 dev uh, opencv and those other components matplotlib and see see what happens if i install from the autopilot wiki current web page onto raspbian bookworm Well, that sure took quite a long time. I didn't have to actually do anything. It feels like it took about 10 minutes. I've just fast forwarded through you so you don't have to watch it. But really, it was just that one command, type yes and wait. So let's do the next command, which is the key part. I got the information from Stephen Dade on the RD Public Discord. And to install Mav Proxy, I need to do this. I 
Okay. So having installed MavProxy, I can now connect to the Cube Red using MavProxy. And there we have it. MavProxy is connected to the Cube Red light controller. There it is right there. Cube Red web server is running. Where's my Well, let's check. I'm going to do so. It's this ID, this map is 30, and so we've got our TCP bound to 000 5760 connection from here from 192.168.2 uh, used. FTP to connect and grab the parameters and we're running 4.5.0 development right so I could try arm and it will refuse it'll say it can't do it because it's not valid I could change my mode to fly by wire A Okay, so, you know, I've got map proxy. I can basically run any connection to the flight controller. The next thing we need to do is deal with the uh, Ardu Pilot web applet, the website. The Cube Red with the Ardu Pilot networking in setup, and uh, you've just seen that running, will run and publishes the website and you can access it, but it's not going to be accessible outside of the Raspberry Pi unless you have a network route to get to the Raspberry Pi um, and or you know its IP address. And remember, uh, when you fire up the Raspberry Pi on your local network, it might get an address um, and we've got a fixed IP address on it. And that fixed IP address, on if it's set up for your local Wi-Fi network, is not going to work if that Raspberry Pi comes up on the internet and, or connected via a, let's say, a data stick or some other Wi-Fi. Let's say you're running a little Wi-Fi adapter or an ESP32 or so, let's, something like that for a local connection on, at a flying field, uh, which could work. Um, it's actually quite doable but you may find you don't get the IP, uh, the access to uh, the traffic from your PC because the PC will see the Pi, but the PC won't necessarily see the, um, uh, the flight controller. Now, there are several different ways you can do this, but from a security perspective, I think, and it's a best practice really, uh, that something like a website should be exposed via a proxy. In other words, it shouldn't be exposed directly. Hackers will find it, hackers will hack into it, and before you know it, hackers will figure out a way to either crash your drone or make it do things you don't want to do. The better answer is to run a proxy, and the simplest and cleanest and most efficient proxy that I know of to run on Raspberry Pi is uh, Nginx. Um, and so I'm going to install that and we'll set it up as a proxy. So it's pretty simple to install. And that's it, Nginx is up and running. Um, not much you can see there, I guess. Um, I think. I think. I'm not 100% sure, but I might be able to hit the website. We'll just pop up a little browser window. And if we go... We have a website and it's running on the QBread Pi. If you remember, QBread is the VPN address by tail scale that I can use to hit that Raspberry Pi that front ends the QBread. 
and I don't need to think about it. I don't need to remember the IP address. I can just go there. So the next thing we want to do is to quickly set that up. So I'm going to install a few pieces of software now. And to do that, I need to download the uh, installers mostly off GitHub. I could put it in temp. I tend to like to keep what I install around. So I'm going to make myself a directory called install. And, and then we'll start by grabbing uh, the installer for Mav P2P. Okay, so well, I guess that's for your information. If you're rousing, running a Raspberry Pi 2, zero, uh, two z Raspberry Pi 0 2 W or 0 2, and you've got the 64 bit Raspbian installed, then you need ARM 64 V8. And that is pretty much it. So now I should be able to just run Mav P2P command manually. Okay, that's connecting. So I can actually connect to the uh, to the flight controller over the Ethernet over UDP. I can actually, just for your interest, I could do it um, also using TCP/IP as well because I've created both of those ports. There it is connected as at port 560. So not like Mav proxy, which I wanted to show you, but I have a problem with installing it, but at least that proves that that works. So what I need to do now is I need to get, I'm gonna uh, download some standard scripts that I've created and I'll show you that in a tick. I've got the cube red and the cube red's available on an IP address with a Mavlink feed. So what I like to do to get the single Mavlink feed from the flight controller so I don't overload it, I then use Mav P2P as a as a Mavlink router to send the traffic from the uh, from the flight controller to wherever it needs to go. So as an example, this will this Mavlink Mav P2P command here will take the traffic from 192.168.144.30, which as you saw is what we've configured on the flight controller as its IP address and we're going to send it to the Zenbook. Now if I just press enter on that what you'll see on the screen here is it connects and immediately the Q ground control connects. It connects automatically. It doesn't need to do anything. It, it sees a UDP feed and let's go check the parameters if we go to this ID, this Mav, there it is, number 30. It's the cube red primary, and actually we can probably see that in here as well. There's the cube red primary. So Mav P2P will route the traffic wherever I want it to go. Now what I have done is I've set up a little script because I want it to do a little bit more than that. So let's just have a quick look at the script. This is my this is my script and this script basically will take run map p2p it takes an input feed from my autopilot ip address and then it feeds an output feed creates an output server um, output server feed to to at 5760 so that I could connect at 5760 or at 14550 and then it sends that same UDP feed um, from a client perspective to 
my Zen book, my ground station host at 14550. And then it starts two feeds for local consumption. It starts one at 14551 and it starts one at 14552. The reason why I do that is that I want to be able to run Mavlink to REST and Drone Engage to connect to uh, their own Mavlink feed. And this basically puts two separate Mavlink feeds available at two separate ports, which I can then run different services to connect to those. So the second thing that I want to do is that I have put, I have created a service and that's this service definition basically is going to have um, the Raspberry Pi start that Mavlink command as a service whenever the system comes up. So I don't have to do anything, it'll just work. And it runs as the user Pi and it starts that script. Um, well, it actually starts as a parent script that just runs that script in a loop. Um, I find that just a little easier to manage. I mean, it's a little complex, but it, it keeps things simple in my mind. So the service starts at a, a daemon script. The daemon script just runs in a loop. Well, let me show you. Now, if I do we should see that Mavlink starts and if all goes well there we go. Um, Mavlink is now running and it's again connected automatically to Q Ground Control. So the only last thing that I want to do with that is I want to enable that so that that will come up automatically the Raspberry Pi boots. So now we've got Mavlink available.